Today we are going to talk about why do we share? Or what are the origins of the paid forward that we see on the internet? Because you see the internet seems to be a special place, a place where you can get something for nothing. Normally in life we have to pay for what we consume, but it seems that on the internet you can get something for nothing. It starts from uh, information and knowledge that people post online to benefit other people. Anything from uh, how to mix a cocktail to movie critics. And it continues with digital goods that people share. Pictures, music, movies that people share online, sometimes legally and sometimes not so legally. If you have a problem with anything from your laptop to your relationship, you can be sure that if you post your question online, somebody will take the time to write your response. Somebody that you probably never even met takes the time to write a response to your problem. A wonderful example of the online sharing is open source software. Software that is created by volunteers. Anyone can contribute and anyone can also download the software and use it, free of charge. There's been a lot of buzz recently about user-generated content and several companies try to take advantage of that to make money. Companies like YouTube or Twitter. Now it's not clear whether they will be able to make money, but it is clear that the users that create this content do not get paid for it. They do it just to benefit other people. And we benefit from watching funny videos on YouTube. Now, why is it that we contribute? Why is it that we do things without getting paid from them? Several theoreticians try to explain that. One theory says that we do it because we would like to gain reputation for being generous or that there is some prestige associated with givings. I just said it's simpler. People just want to solve their own problems. So if you have a technical problem with your computer, you just solve it for your own benefit and then it so happens that you also spend time letting other people know what the solution was. I just said it's even simpler than that. These people do that not to benefit others, but to benefit themselves. It's like companies give away free samples of products to convince you to buy the big package. So programmers may contribute to open source software just to demonstrate how competent they are, hoping that eventually they will be hired for jobs or contracts based on the free samples of software that they gave. Finally, some people say people give because the internet is a huge system of paid forward, also known as generalized exchange or indirect reciprocity. They say that there are certain norms of giving online, that the internet is a gift economy and that reciprocity may not be direct. Today we are going to focus on the first and the last explanation. I will show you that people are willing to help others to gain reputation for being generous and the generalized exchange or pay it forward is something that emerges very easily even between complete strangers. In fact, I'll make three important points today. One, generalized exchange is very widespread. We do it all the time and it happens around us all the time. Two, it takes very little to get generalized exchange going. And I'll demonstrate it to you with a bunch of strangers who never met each other and know that they are helping people that they will never meet. And three, I will show you that people's willingness to help others, to benefit others, changes. It has to do with people's desire to be generous to others that are generous. It also has to do with people's strategic desire to develop a reputation for themselves as generous. It is affected by people's personal values. Some personal values encourage contributions. Other personal values discourage contributions. 
And finally, it has to do with emotions. Let's make a clear distinction between direct exchange and generalized exchange. Often when we talk about exchange, we think about direct exchange. And direct exchange can take many forms. There are many forms of direct exchange. One form is, uh, I give you money and you give me a bag of tomatoes. This is a form of direct exchange. Another form is, you do a favor for me and I take you out for lunch. This is very different from buying tomatoes, but it's still a case of direct exchange. Because in direct exchange, there's a pair. I do something for you and you do something for me. This is why people call it, I'll scratch your back and you'll scratch mine, or quid pro quo in Latin. Generalized exchange is different, because in generalized exchange you have not two, but at least three people. I do a favor for you, but I don't expect you to pay back the favor to me. Rather, I expect you to pay the favor forward to someone else. And that person is then expected to pay the favor forward once again to other people. So generalized exchange involves at least three people and as you can imagine the favor spreads forward among people as they are all paying it forward. Now we are of course not the first people to think about generalized exchange or pay it forward. It has its roots in the Bible and Benjamin Franklin was one of the people that talked about generalized exchange and in a letter from 1784 he writes I do not pretend to give such a sum. I only lend it to you. When you meet with another honest man in similar distress, you must pay me by lending this sum to him. I hope it thus may go through many hands. This is a trick of mine for doing a deal of good with a little money. Science fiction writer Robert Heinlein wrote about generalized exchange and he described the following scene. The banker reached into the folds of his gown, pulled out a single credit note. Do me the honor of accepting this as a welcome to the newcomer. Don took it and said, uh, thanks, that's awfully kind of you, I'll pay it back, first chance. Instead, pay it forward to some other brother who needs it. Political scientist Robert Putnam of Harvard University recently wrote that the touchstone of social capital is the principle of generalized exchange. I'll do this for you now without expecting anything immediately in return and perhaps even without knowing you, confident that down the road you or someone else will return the favor. Now this is what theoreticians, writers, statesmen wrote about generalized exchange. But how does it happen in reality? Is generalized exchange some idea that we should all strive to achieve? Or is it something that is widespread and is happening all the time around us? We created an experiment to study this question. To study generalized exchange, we invited 16 randomly chosen people to come to our behavioral laboratory. When they showed up, we paid them for coming. We gave them a sum of money for showing up. We then invited them to participate in the experiment, if they wanted to. And we told them this. You will now sit in separate cubicles, looking at computer monitors. And the computer will match you with another person in this room. You will never know who you were matched with, and they will never know your identity. You will not even be able to communicate with this person. You will just make a single decision, transfer or no transfer. If you decide to transfer, we'll take 20 cents of the money we gave you and we'll give it to the person that you were matched with. To the 20 cents that you lost, we'll add 80 cents so that the person receives a dollar. You lose 20 cents, they gain a dollar. You don't know who they are and they don't know who you are, so there's no chance you will ever be paid back by the same person. After you made the decision, we will rematch you with someone else, and then you can be again a giver or a receiver where the other person is making your decision. 
We also incorporated in the experiment a couple of conditions that we thought might affect the willingness of people to give. For one, we told them that in some of the decisions they will be making, other people will know whether they are giving, and in some decisions, the decision will be completely private. No one will ever know whether they give. Again, sometimes when they give, they will be able to see what was the past behavior of the recipient. How generous was that person in the past towards other people, towards third parties? And in some situations, they will not be able to receive this information. Finally, we thought that locations might interfere with people's willingness to give, so we ran the exact same experiment in two locations, one in Singapore and the other one in Michigan in the United States. Here are the results. One, you're probably wondering, would people really give their money to complete strangers without any chance of receiving back from the person you gave to? Well, you may be surprised to learn that most of the time people did send money to those complete strangers. 55% of the time people chose to give. But this average hides some important differences in, willing, in the willingness of people to give. For one, we found that people are highly sensitive to others' behavior. If you were generous in the past, I am much more likely to transfer to you. If you were stingy in the past, you are less likely to receive transfer. So people are willing to reward others' people's generous behavior by paying money out of their own pocket to reward other people that were generous, not towards them or their family, but towards other anonymous third party. This may be surprising. But may also be, what we also may be surprising is that at the same time, while these people are paying to reward the generosity of others, they're highly strategic when it comes to their own reputation. Remember that one of the conditions we introduced is that sometimes when you make a decision, the decision is made privately and nobody knows about this decision except you and the recipient. Sometimes when you make a decision, that decision goes on your record and other people may be able to see it in the future. We see that this makes a big difference. When people know that their decision will be visible, they're much more likely to give than when the decision is made in private. In fact, we saw a number of people that gave absolutely nothing when the decision was made in private. But when they knew that the decision is done publicly, they gave all the time. So these are people that were very strategic to create for themselves a reputation of givers. We also found that there were significant differences between the United States and Singapore, but we are able to explain these differences by the differences in social values, in personal values, in the two locations. Personal values are things that we believe in, things that are important for us, and they tend to be relatively stable across situations in life. It could be to what extent you want power, or how important it is for you to just enjoy life, or how important it is for you to conform to social expectations. We thought that two values will be particularly important in explaining the willingness of people to help strangers. One of them is achievement, which is personal success by demonstrating competence according to social standards, things such as success, wealth, ambition. Another is universalism that has to do with understanding, appreciation, tolerance, and protection for the welfare of all people and for nature. Things like honesty, broad-mindedness, protecting the environment, and finding meaning in life. We found that people that were higher on the values of universalism were more likely to give. It also turns out that we had more of these people in Michigan, in the United States, which meant that people in Michigan, on average, were more likely to give than people in Singapore. 
People in Singapore, on the other hand, were higher on the value of achievements. And the value of achievement led them to give less. As a result, we found that in Singapore, people were less willing to give than people in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So we found that values make a difference, and values can explain differences between locations, between countries. So generalized exchange is extremely widespread. It happens all the time. It's not some lofty ideals that appears in books, but it's something that can emerge very quickly. It also takes very little. You don't need people that knew each other for years or are good friends or are all part of the same team. You just take 16 strangers that never met each other. They communicate with each other anonymously through computers, but they're willing to deal with something that's near and dear to our hearts, and they take their own money and give it to strangers. And finally, we showed you that the willingness to give is not uniform. It has to do with benefiting people that were generous towards other people. It has to do with creating a reputation for yourself as a giver. It also has to do with your own personal values. And it has to do with emotions. Thank you.